Uh, you cannot separate the religion of a people from the culture of the people and even the foreign policy of the people. Everything about a people is informed by their religion. Believe it or not, everybody has a religion. Every country has a religion. Even if you say, wait, no, the United States has separation of church and state. Actually, no, we don't. The state religion just happens to not be Christianity or Judaism or Islam, God forbid. It is environmentalism. That's our state religion. If you step outside the box a little bit in your thinking and say, well, tenets of a religion, you have to have faith. You have to have a answer for your meaning in life. That's what religion gives you. It provides a path to redemption, maybe forgiveness. It explains the problem of sin. It has some answer for what happens after this life, those kinds of things. If you go through that, environmental is all the tenets of a religion. And believe me, people adhere to it like a religion without a doubt. So it's just the politically correct state religion. Do you understand that if you take Christian morals away from our society, it's not going to then have no morals. If you try to go to a completely secular society, secularism is a very weak belief system. And the morality of secularism is so weak that it can't stand on its own. So it will be supplanted by some other stronger system of morality. And so is this a religious war between Israel and Iran? Absolutely. There's a lot of what is happening that is informed by the religions of the two peoples. Do you think if Iran was a Christian country, they'd be at war with Israel right now? Probably not. Actually, if you look at Christian countries around the world, they're not really known for starting wars. The United States is much less of a Christian country than it once was, but at the very least, our system of government is benefiting from the vestiges of when America was a Christian country. And a state cannot really have a true religion anyway. They can try to pander to one religious group or another, but they, they can't do it. This is a religious conflict in that sense. You could make a, a case for the fact that this is a conflict over worldview. But like I said, worldview is informed by religion. So there you go. What happened today in Israel is that the Israeli army is pushing more troops into southern Lebanon. They are taking over more villages. They're now six kilometers into Lebanon at this point and created a buffer zone along the border. And it's likely that they're going to have troops in that buffer zone for the foreseeable future. There are a couple of countries that are pushing for a ceasefire agreement with Lebanon. And whether or not that happens, we'll have to wait and see. So the Israelis are moving all along the northern border up there inside Lebanon. And there are a lot of villages that overlook Israel that are up on high points. And you can see them. I've been up there. If you go to Malkia, if you go to Jish, any of those areas, you can stand up there on high points and you see Lebanese villages on hilltops across the border. Okay. The IDF is systematically going through those villages now. And what they're finding is exactly what they found in Gaza, that those were not civilian villages that had a smattering of military hardware s stored here and there in the village. Those were military bases disguised as villages. That's really what they were. It's an aerial view of a village inside Lebanon. The, actually, the border is that white line that's just on the bottom left going from 
the bottom left is the border. This village butts up against the border with Israel. What they found inside this village was that virtually every building was in some way, shape, or form connected to Hezbollah. And they didn't just find one village like this. They found many villages like this. Obviously, it's going to take them some time to clean that out. They are collecting up all the stuff that they're finding and now starting to use it against the fighters that they're encountering along the way, making good use of it. In the south, Gaza has captured 1,200 Hamas fighters in Jabalia alone in the last two weeks. And they have taken out or liquidated another 1,500 of them. So they're making very good progress in there. We're getting down to the end of Hamas at this point. So very good uh, to see that happening. We have a few slots left for our trip to Armenia next June. If you'd like to travel with me and my wife to an absolutely amazing place. Uh, I found out just recently that Armenia was actually the setting that C.S. Lewis used when he uh, crafted the country of Narnia. When he wrote the books, the Chronicles of Narnia, he used Armenia as the template for Narnia. As a matter of fact, if you read the original books, there was writing that was Narnian writing in the books that he made up. If you look closely at it, it's actually Armenian letters upside down. So he just took Armenian language and turned the letters upside down, and that was Narnian. So if you want to see what real life Narnia looks like, come with us to Armenia. It's a great tour in June, and we've got a couple slots left of that. Let's go back to what I wanted to talk about with how Israel and Trump can win the war and shape Middle Eastern policy. A new Middle East is what we're talking about. The Trump administration has an opportunity to join with Israel in not just making Israel safe from more attacks or decimating the proxy forces in Lebanon and Yemen and Iraq and Syria. Donald Trump has an opportunity to take advantage of this conflict in Israel and help Israel craft a new Middle East out of this. First of all, just doing exactly what the Biden administration didn't do would be a good start. The Trump administration could take the brakes off of Israel and say, Israel, do your thing. You guys got this and we're, we got your back and provide them with whatever weapons, whatever defensive capabilities they need to go after it and then let them do it. You, if you've been watching me for a while, I think that the, the war in Ukraine is a strategic opportunity for America to decimate one of our major foes, Russia, and make them so that they're never gonna be a threat to us in the conventional realm ever again, and do it without spending a single drop of American blood. And that is by essentially paying the Ukrainians to do our fighting for us. Turning Iran's strategy of funding proxy forces so that it doesn't have to get its hands dirty, on its head and us doing the same thing back to them. Because Iran is not a direct military threat to America in any meaningful sense right now, this is a perfect time for America to support the country that is under direct military threat from Iran in such a way that they can decimate Iran's capabilities likely in a way that would lead to regime change. This is what we want to push for. If I was the president's advisor, what I would be saying to Donald Trump is, short of us sending Marines into Iran, killing all their leaders and converting the rest of the country to Christianity, probably the smartest thing we could do would be to just pump everything that Israel needs into Israel and say, Israel, go to town and just crush Iran so that everybody in the region will see Iran is not a threat. Why do you think Saudi Arabia, the UAE, 
Bahrain, even Morocco. Why do you think those guys signed on to the Abraham Accords in the first place? Because they love Israel? They really like Israel? No. They don't necessarily like Israel. They're just not stupid. They look at a Middle East that is controlled by Iran and they go, that's not a good look. That is not going to end well for any of us. We don't want Iran being the hegemon in the Middle East. And so then they say, if we don't want them to do it, here's the United States via Israel. They would be a very good trading partner. They've got 11, 12 million people that have very high income, could buy a lot of stuff from us, offer a lot of trade, a lot of tourism. And it might actually be nice not to have the whole Middle East on fire for just like one year. Most people in Saudi Arabia are too young to remember why they hate Israel. Nobody in that region really wants Iran to be calling the shots. They have a, an image problem if a Muslim country goes to war against this other Muslim country. That causes problems with all the other Muslim countries. They would almost rather see Israel do it. Go do that dirty work. And Israel has the capability to do it. So if we just went to Israel and said, we're backing you up 100%, take out Iran, and then we will support whatever replaces it. Because there's a lot of people in Iran that would love to see the regime in Iran go. I would say the vast majority of people in Iran would like to see the regime go. I know because I talk to them when they come to Armenia on vacation. So that's what is at stake here, is a whole new Middle East. And this trophy that is just out of reach is achievable if the United States throws its weight in the ring behind Israel. So what's the alternative? If the United States shows weakness in the region, or God forbid continues to not support Israel in the way that they should be supported, then we're going to see further anti-Semitism rising up all around the world. Do you understand that if Israel wins this thing and ends the war, and peace comes to that region, those college kids that are all out there rioting in the streets, they're going to find something else to do. They don't really have the courage of their convictions. They're not going to plant a flag for the rest of their life on protesting against Israel. The UN is making itself obsolete. It's showing itself to be in bed with terrorist organizations. I have been a war correspondent for more than 20 years, and I've seen the UN at work in many places around the world, and I've never yet seen one place where the UN actually made the problem better. Most of the time, they exacerbate the problem rather than making it improve. So thank you very much for watching. We will see you later. God bless you and have a great weekend.